All right, everyone. Welcome back to another weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. Today, I'm joined as always by my happy co-host, Mark. Happy. I'm in the mood for happy. a happy I'm Saturday wearing, podcast. Yeah. yeah. Happy works. I, uh, you know, I'm wearing the bluebird color. You know, yeah. spring is is definitely. Although, you know, down here in Chapel Hill, all does rain. I mean, it is it is getting relentless. So, mm. uh, quick reveal. So, I am doing the uh, the Bitcoin orange pants today. So we got that going. But I, had, nice. I found my Bitcoin roller coaster socks. And as I said, part of the challenge of a roller coaster, it's not the ups and downs. By the way, did I tell you about my trip to Dollywood? I mean, amazing. Absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. So uh, it's like a combination of Disney plus Magic Mountain. Like Disney, fine. It's great. Mm -hmm. It's nice. Mm -hmm. The rides are not, not good. Yeah. The rides at Magic Mountain, amazing. The rides mm -hmm. at Dollywood, even more amazing. I was Where, sorry. What is Dollywood? I don't even Dollywood know. Dollywood is. is a giant amusement park in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, right in the middle of the country. It is it's <laughs> Disneyland heard. for people in the center of the country. I'm sorry. Now, is this Dolly Parton? Is Dolly that Parton, where it comes from? Dolly Parton set it up. <laughs> Dolly Parton is, That's is amazing. amazing right? I mean, she she is. does all this stuff for you know literacy, and she's totally revitalized her her home state and. Yeah, she's from this little tiny town that you would drive by a hundred times out of a hundred. Um, but we went glamping for my 60th birthday and we went to Dollywood and I expected it to be fine. Nope. Way better than Disney, like way better okay. in terms of better laid out. The show we went to was amazing. It was like a Broadway quality show. I mm. mean, it was, it was, it was good. It was good. Nice. And nice. the rides, you know, when you go on Space Mountain at, you know, it's, it's the mini roller coaster at, at Disney, it's fine. You know, a couple ups and downs, but you end up in the same place. And that's the problem with roller coasters is you end up in the same place. So that's where Bitcoin has been doing this kind of up and down and up and down, but it's in the same place as it was a few months ago. Um, actually, yeah. it's in the same place it was a year ago. Um, so with that, it's uh, everyone should go to Dollywood this summer. It's It was very cool. Yeah. We're chopping. Bitcoin price is chopping. We can we can talk about that in a bit. I'd love to um I'd love to get your thoughts on. We heard from the Fed whisperer. We had an article come out this week from from Nick Timoros at the, the Wall Street Fed Journal. Fed whisperer, I like. Yeah, it. I mean that's he's the Caesar Chavez of speaking to Jerome Powell. So he uh so the the title of this article is the Fed prepares to skip June rate rise but hike later. So I actually didn't realize that there's the. Uh, you know, you can pause, you can hike, or you can skip. And it looks like we're in for a skip uh, this June. So I'd be curious uh, what you make of that, Mark. Look, um, <laughs> it's it's all a game, right? Mm. It's a game to enrich the banks, who then in turn buy stocks to keep the market elevated so the boomers have something to retire on. It's It's just a game. And so before they rate, they lowered rates to zero to you know to fix the banks after the global financial crisis. Yeah. Well, how does how does that fix them? Well, people stop buying treasuries because you know America pissed a bunch of people off. So the Chinese stopped buying our treasuries. The Japanese start buy stop buying our treasuries. We got to sell treasuries to somebody. Ah, I have a good idea. We'll lower rates to zero for the banks, not for anybody else. No, no one I know got zero interest rate loans, but the banks did. So the banks take that money and they bought bonds at 3%, 2%. It's perfect, riskless trade. You lever that up 10, 11, 12, 15 times. Uh, and, you know, JP Morgan had zero losing trading days the last however many years. Like, if you're actually trading, that's impossible. But you're not trading, you're doing arbitrage. So, so that went on for a long time. And then they kept interest rates really low for, for a very long time. People are like, why? The economy is not, we're not in a depression anymore. We're not even in a recession anymore. Why are you keeping interest rates at zero? Because we got to get the bank balance sheets back to a level that, that they can, can support you know, being banks. Um, make a long story short, then they start raising rates. Well, why do they start raising rates? Huh. Well, we need higher rates for capitalism to actually work. 
right? You can't have zero or negative rates and have capitalism actually work because you have to have the ability to earn a return on your capital for promising it forward and using it. So they start raising rates. Well, this is really cool. So during the zero interest rates, when the rest of the world would sell surplus bonds, who would buy them? The central banks, right? The Fed, other central banks, they were the buyers of last resort. Okay, so they all said, well, we're going to stop buying. We're going to do QT. We're going to get our balance sheets down. Okay, so who's going to buy all the bonds? Well, again, it's got to be the banks or it's got to be, you know, somebody. I don't know. Who else, who else is going to buy them? So they really ramped up the last year. They really ramped up this, all right, banks, you got to buy lots of bonds. So yeah. they bought all these bonds. Well, but if rates go up and you own these bonds at zero or two or three, what happens? We get big unrealized losses. Then you have this banking crisis. So then what do you do? Well, now, quietly, you're paying 4 or 5% on the deposits with the Fed to the banks directly, right? The Fed's actually paying the banks directly. So that's QE even though you don't call it QE because you're not buying bonds, but you're paying the banks directly. So then what happens? Well, the banks start buying futures and stocks, even though that's not their mandate. So that's why we got these little crazy you know, market moves. And then on top of it, you throw in the AI cocktail. Oh my God, everything's AI. And you, you, got, you got the perfect short squeeze, which is what we've had. And the narrowness of the market, you want to talk about Sinister Saturday, okay? Mm. Lack of breadth is death to bear markets. Yeah. There is no time in history where you had a, in, a decreasing number of stocks going up and the rest flat to down, and that's good. So anyway, that's a long convoluted story about, it's always about the Fed and the relationship to banks. So the skip, is just nonsense, right? It's not mm. a pause. It's not a easing. It's not a printer go burr. The printer's going burr every day. They're sending money to the banks who are putting it back into equities. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I don't agree with you on the, you know, the overarching sort of idea of, you know, funneling money into a particular place, but I do agree. <laughs> I do. No, but you I, are, I, I love, I love your idealism. I, I went on a walk with my wife last night and we had the same conversation. She says, you know, you know, I, I'm just not going to listen to your conspiracy theories. I'm like, they're not conspiracies if they're true, right? That, that, is, that is the definition of not a conspiracy. So yeah. the fact of the matter is there's documented proof of this movement of, of capital between these institutions. And again, good, good people can agree to disagree. Yeah, I agree with that. But here's what I, here's what I do agree with you on is I, you know, the, you're around, I, it was like November 21 or something like that when the Fed signaled that it was going to change its position when it came to interest rates. And, you know, a lot of people fa failed to see the forest for the trees. I mean, there was a lot of, oh, well, the Fed can't do this or that. And, you know, it was one of those things that's perfectly obvious in, in hindsight, but very difficult to to parse out at the time. And, you know, part of me wonders, you know, if we're in sort of a similar similar spot here where, you know, we've talked about this last week, but I do think we're in a little weird period of limbo here where it feels like there's some some pain to come, but we haven't quite had it yet. The Fed's been raising rates for a while. But I think that the thing that I'm at least starting to feel pretty sure on I don't think I'm going out on too far of a limb here to say is that the bulk of the the raises are behind us at this point. So I think the way I sort of interpreted this, and there's actually a quote from, I think this is the the Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker. I think we can take a bit of a skip for a meeting. And frankly, if we're going to go into a period where we need to do more tightening, we can do that every other meeting. And I think I think with the Fed, the way I interpret that is, Let's just wait and see. I feel like we've done a lot. I have we haven't seen some of the stuff we thought we were gonna see. 
stuff doesn't really happen in the summer anyway. Maybe let's give the market a couple months to digest this. And I, I don't know if that bodes well or particularly ill. There's actually a great chart. I'll see if I can pull it up here, but it's Stan Druckenmiller's sort of recession indicator. And it's the relative outperformance of uh, small caps, uh, housing stock here. Let me just, yeah. So this is median of outperformance of banks, retail, home builders, auto, and small caps versus the S and P 500. So we're closing in on, uh, one of, uh, Druck's preferred, uh, you know, recession indicators here as well. So I would, I would again, just go back to, I feel like we're at this place where we're pausing. I think policymakers and officials are worried about the you know finally facing the music of the impact of the the change in monetary conditions they affected many months ago at this point and signs are looking relatively bad and you can inter- it's you know it, you can interpret that in a whole bunch of different ways because sometimes there are long recessions uh, after this when something breaks sometimes something breaks like covid and then the policy makers we need to come in immediately and and uh, affect large change to make th- sure things don't spiral out yeah. of control. So it's just very hard to know what's going to happen here. But you know, I sort of keep going back to this idea that we're in limbo. It kind of looks like there's this looming disaster, but it's it's unsure at this point how bad it's really. Well, oh, see, I, I I don't think it's hard to know at all, mm-hmm. right? Look at all of the data coming out from the regional Fed surveys. I mean, collapse, utter and complete collapse. You know, indicating the PMIs are are going down into the 40s, maybe even the 30s. I mean, we're talking really bad, ugly, uh, you know, shift backwards in in productivity and in, in production and in, in GDP. And you know, here's the interesting thing: rising rates are a sign of economic strength. Right? Just, just I think agree. About it. Right. Just yeah. think about it. The, the only way you could raise interest rates is if the economy is strong and can handle it and it's producing enough cash flow that um, it, it can pay off the debt. I mean, you know, big problem. The government has to refinance a quarter of their debt in the next, I think, 12 to 18 months. It's currently at zero, like literally yeah. zero point something. Now it's five. The budget that busts the budget, they like, totally busts it. So, so that's interesting. Can, can now, I just underscore, Mark? Because that's such an important point. Why that is that rising rates are a sign of economic strength. Yield comes from growth. Those two yes. concepts are yes. interrelated. If you are growing as a business or as an economy, you can afford. Right, you're financing yourself with credit. And you can afford, if your revenues are growing, you can afford to pay off interest yield. Those two concepts are 100%. one and the same. In, in theory, if the economy was rising or you know, booming, then tax revenues would be higher and right. you could afford the debt. The problem is that ain't happening. The tax revenues are actually going the other way. And so the deficit... Just keeps going up, so they they raise the debt ceiling. What 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 Kabuki theater nonsense is that? I'm glad it's behind us. But here here's the interesting thing: roller coaster. Back to my roller coaster. The Dow is precisely like almost to the penny where it was one year ago. Up, down, up, down, up, flat. Okay. The yeah. S and P. Okay. Now, what's the difference between the Dow and the S and P? Well, the Dow is pretty narrow, 30 stocks, but it is representative of industrial America. It's kind of an old-fashioned kind of big, solid companies. It's got some tech companies, but but not that many. The S&P is dominated by tech companies because it's (laughs) capitalization-weighted. So now 14% of it, 14% is two stocks. Apple and Microsoft, and it's up a, a smidge. It's up about 2%, okay? And that's all because of this recent short rallying, short covering rally, but because the NASDAQ is up 9%. 
So all of this is the gains really since January. And why did we have gains since January? Well, because the rumor, the, the Fed whisperer, oh, there's going to be a pause. And they raise it. No, no, I, I swear there's going to be a pause. And they raise it again. No, I, come on. I, I am certain now there's going to be not a pause, but a skip. So we have this illusion. And so all of the increase in stocks this year is multiple expansion. Earnings have gone down, not up. And you got an occasional company here or there, but generally speaking, earnings are down. So you got this crazy multiple expansion back to levels that we've just never seen. And look, NVIDIA set the, set the bar. It used to be Cisco was the bar, right? It was the worst valued company in history in 2000. And, you know, I used to talk about it. Like to make a 10% return, it was going to take 300 years. Yeah. Which didn't happen, right? It went down 84% and it's still down 23 years later. And I tweeted out uh, something last week about uh, Intel. Okay. Right before mm-hmm. 2000 bubble, Andy Grove was the time man of the year. Chips to change the world. Wait, did, did that sound familiar? Chips to change the world. And Intel went from sub a dollar to $120. I mean, went totally parabolic. Like overlay the charts. They look exactly the same. Today, today, it's down 60%. 23 years later. So this idea that these parabolic moves are durable is silly. It's it's just people are innumerate. And it's not even that they can't do math. They don't want to do math. They're tired of math. They don't want to ever see math again. They got out of school. No more math. Okay, fine. But I'm I'm in a debate this morning with this guy. There's this silly company. I shouldn't say it's a silly company. C3 AI. And and they are not new, right? They've been around, I don't know, maybe even 10 years. Because AI is not new. AI has been around for 53 years. 53 years. And the C3 AI company has never made money. They Mm -hmm. will never make money. They, their, their ticker is AI. And so because their ticker is AI, when ChatGPT got released, it went ballistic. And they reported no earnings yesterday. And the stock collapsed 21%. That's just the first down. It's going to go, I mean, it should go to zero, but it, it, it's going to go down a lot. People are like, no, 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 it's got great leadership, it's got great vision. I'm like, no, you, as a company, you actually have to make money eventually. Now, yeah. willing suspension of disbelief, fine, like going to the movies. Um, you know, I really feel like, I just watched it again for the 13th time, I think Tom Cruise is flying that plane. I have willing suspension of disbelief that in Maverick, he is flying that plane. He's not. But people want to believe. Hey, everyone. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but just wanted to let you know that we've got our permissionless conference coming up. This is the one that we do with Bankless. It is the biggest and best conference in DeFi. It's going to be in Austin, Texas this year, September 11th through the 13th. If you've been in crypto for a while, you know that bear market conferences are the best conferences because those are the ones that all the alphas at. This year, we've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers and the topics that we're covering are insane. We're going to be talking about ZK Tech, Rollups, Account Abstraction, MEV, App Change, the whole suite of stuff. I cannot wait myself. So because you're a listener of this podcast, you're also going to get a discount. Type in pods 20 and you're going to get 20% off your ticket. Click the link at the bottom of this episode and go get it now because prices go up every two weeks. Well, let's let's take a look at this. So if you're following along via video here that we're looking at NVIDIA's Q1 income statement, this has become a very popular way of visualizing uh, P&L. And I, I'm not actually sure how I feel about it, but I guess it's interesting. You can look at the the way they break out their revenue, which is data centers, uh, gaming, professional visualization, automotive, OEM, and other. The vast majority of that is data center and gaming. 
data, I mean, the growth numbers are are large and they're very real. So I did $7.2 billion worth of revenue in Q1, 4.3 of that was data center, 2.2 of that was gaming. And then, you know, us, the rest, it was, it's about, you know, 0.7 7 billion that was spread out across their other, their other parts of their business. The net profit on that was 2 billion. So that's that is not horrendous in terms of uh, Except profit margin. That's the adjusted numbers. The actual numbers are six point one billion in revenue and one point five billion in profit. See, there's this. We have the highest level, Michael, of non-gap adjustments in history. Right? It's just lying. It's all it is. is that does that really apply to net profit as well? I usually thought that was EBITDA. There it is. That, six that gets- and one point five. Right. I mean, it's right there in and it's everybody who posts these numbers is taking the non-gap numbers, the adjusted. Yeah. And it's it's so frustrating because it's frustrating to me, too. Every once in a while, it, you we've hear these- never seen an epidemic of yeah. fraud like this. And I, I'll call it what it is. It's fraud. Right. And, you know, you can. Don't even get me started on Tesla's numbers. Oh my God. I mean, the way, the only one that was the, the we work, we work was the worst, right? Yeah. Community adjusted EBITDA. They actually converted expenses, advertising expenses to get people in, into revenue. Yeah. Like, no. But stock-based compensation is the same thing. That is not revenue. That is an expense. And but and it, well, Mark, how do we how do we solve this? Because this was right. This was like post Enron. This was the first dot com bubble that everyone everyone sort of rallied and said, "Hey, this is enough." Right? We've we've had it, we've had it up to here with this adjusted EBITDA non gap BS, and we're not going to take it anymore. And now now here we are back here, you know, more than twenty years later, and it's the same stuff going on, but but even more exaggerated. And and every once in a while, I listen to these podcasts with. Jim Chanos and he'll sort of howl at the moon and shake yeah. his yeah, no, I, at the, oh no, at Jimmy, the sky. Jimmy, and, Jimmy must have really good vocal cords because he's been howling mm-hmm. for decades. And there might not be a better analyst in the world than Jim Chanos. I mean, yeah. I mean, Steve Mandel's pretty close, and there's probably a few others that I'm missing. But now the problem is Jim deals in, in reality. And he won't deal in fiction. And that's been costly during these bubble periods. But what we know with certainty, all manias end in panic. I've been tweeting out the cover of Kindleberger's book from from the 1900s, Manias, Manias, Panics, and Crashes. Every single one. There is not an exception. Right? Jeremy Grantham has all the bubbles in history, stocks, commodities, whatever. Every single one ends. And John Kenneth Galbraith talked about this. He called it the bezel. The bezel is what gets stolen through fraud, exaggeration, manipulation. And in good times, it rises. The bezel goes up. And so the the, the stealing from the shareholders to the management rises. And then a kid says, whoa, dude, the emperor has no clothes. I can't unsee that. And I don't mean a kid, really. But somebody says, end. And it collapses. And how's it collapse? Regulation, right? Reg FD, Dodd Frankenstein, right? We have these big reg, and we, we fix it. And then what happens? The accountants and the lawyers who get paid a lot of money say, ah, oh, we'll just do it this way. We'll create a new class of fraud. Well, stock-based compensation. Awesome. So, and and we're at, we're, we got to be near the very, very peak of this, you know, time of the bezel. And that bezel, and it's where embezzlement comes from, that bezel, that stealing is going to get exposed and it will have an Enron moment. And, and it could be, like Cisco in 2001 reversed like this massive, what they were doing, they would write down their inventory 
they would write it off, right, and take a loss, which made their profits look bad, and they and they'd throw you know kitchen sink it, and then the next quarter they'd sell that inventory with zero cost of goods and blow out numbers and the stock would go crazy. I'm like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Yeah. And and somebody, and so they had to reverse all of that nonsense. And so that's when, you know, the stock started going down. And like I said, it went down 84%. And then everybody got exposed. WorldCom, Enron, and that's going to happen. And I don't know who's the worst offender. I like to say it's Salesforce because- Everything about that is just manipulated BS, but it could be, it could be these guys, right? Um, well, well, so here's the, what I want to kind of dig into here is, you know, so we were just showing, so here, this is the list of the top 10 companies in the S&P 500 by market <laughs> cap. It is Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, NVIDIA, Alphabet, Meta. Berkshire, Tesla, United Healthcare, and I guess uh, technically Google is counted in here twice, so I'll say Exxon as well. So the majority of those are tech companies. Now, what you can see, I mean, these are real businesses and they're good businesses, right? I don't think anyone would contest that Microsoft or Apple have built real substantive, phenomenal businesses. And you know, if you go back in time, right, even the stuff that you and I think about as being very commoditized you know, industrial sort of businesses were at one time technology companies, right? At one point, it wasn't easy to to get oil out of the ground. Yeah. And those were sort of on the cutting edge. And so I do think a part of this is just, this is naturally the cycle that plays over time. I think if I had to try to put my finger on why people feel sort of uneasy about some of this is a lot of the companies that are the largest by market cap companies in the US don't do core infrastructure services to the US. They do nice to haves all around the board. It's like Tesla, right? Which is a extremely highly valued. Look, it's a, it's a, I, I, it creates a good product, right? The Tesla cars are good cars and they were hard to do. You know, he did it at a time when electric cars, same thing with uh, something like Amazon. Amazon is, you know, it's, it's good. It's, it's nice infrastructure, but it's sort of a nice to have. And I think that I think that's where people get a little uneasy and they look and it 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 does give a little bit of a house of cards feeling of, hey, are the companies that we're building over here even to maybe drastically overstate, are these good, valuable companies or are these the product of a low interest rate environment for the past 20 years? Mm -hmm. And I if I had to try to put my finger on, I think why people feel uneasy about this, I think that's that's probably why. But but then when you zoom out, I mean, this is just the wheel of of technological progress sort of churning. I mean, this is what happened. And then I, I sort here's of do the, the reverse, problem. right? Here's, here's the problem. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you, okay? Microsoft, okay? Clearly a good company. Yeah. We all use their products. And, and the proof is they have $200 billion of revenue. It's a lot of revenue. Okay. $200 billion of revenue which is actually rising, right? It's actually gone up each of the last four years, unlike NVIDIA, who had a drop in revenue year over year from 22 to 23, but, but, but still growth company because next quarter they're going to grow. Okay, fine. But they had a drop. Microsoft just goes up and their profits are $72 billion. Okay. Now, $72 billion with two and a half trillion dollar market cap, 36 times earnings for a company that's growing, but not, not growing super fast. Okay. So that's a little egregious, a little egregious. And we're, we're talking about 12 times revenue. Scott McNally said in 2000, at 10 times revenue, for you to earn a 10% return from owning Sun Microsystems, I would have to pay you all of my revenue for the next decade, which would be a problem because I have employees and if I don't pay my taxes, I go to jail and I've cost a good sold. But, but if I could do that, you could make a return. And his stock went down 98%. 98. Now, I'm not saying Microsoft's going to go down 98%, but what I'm saying is- Was that after Microsoft, him saying that? Like, pardon? did the stock react to him- 
giving that little speech because I've heard that speech before. I don't remember the exact timing. I'll have to go back and look. Yeah. But but from that point, almost from the day, it did go down 98%. Because that was 2000, yeah. 2001, 2002. Sure. But here's the thing. NVIDIA, all right? NVIDIA, which has 40% as large a market cap now, $1 trillion instead of $2.5 trillion, all right, has only... Current year, four and a half billion dollars of earnings and 27 billion of revenue. So they have about 12% of the revenue of Microsoft and about 7% of their earnings. So their PE is 200. Like, oh, that doesn't count. That's that's trailing. Okay, let's say they double it in the next 12 months. That's a hundred times earnings. There, it's it's a mania beyond manias. And this one, I'm very comfortable with NVIDIA going down 80, 90 percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the sense in the sense that i I feel like I've talked about this now for a number of weeks and don't have much new to say here, but I think there's, there's going to be overreactions in AI. Like my philosophy on bubbles post, you know, I think it's, uh, at least for someone who works in crypto where <laughs> there are many manias and <laughs> not just one, but there are many multiple manias. My, um, my, my sort of revised viewpoint of them is that in general, they tend to be the big ones tend to be directionally correct but wrong on timing. So yeah. when I look at something like Nvidia, yeah, it's richly valued, but who knows when something gets richly valued and the valuation stops mattering, it could double from here. I have no idea. But but what I it probably won't it probably will not stay there. You know, usually when you've had a run like this, it'll probably you should probably be looking for it to go down at, at some point. And but it does make me think like the AI stuff is is it is very real. I, you know, I really do believe that it is, you know, when you look at what these LLMs do, I'm a, I'm a, you know, on those, you know, on those. All right, no, let yeah. me ask you a question. Okay. Have you used chat GPT? I have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Have you taken anything from chat GPT and actually used it for anything? I like, actually do. Yeah. Okay. All right, tell I, me. I've, tell me. I, I, so what I've, what I've started to, what I've started to use it for, I actually find it pretty helpful is it will, I probably is now like 20% of my search volumes when I'm not looking for something quick, when I'm looking for like, how does this work? You know, I, I've actually found it's a much better interface than something like Google, because what Google gives me, if I'm like, how does this you know, particular model of, uh, honestly, I ask it a lot of crypto based questions. Like how does this particular no, okay. model right. of token right. work? Google, well, what it, what it does is it tries to hit articles that have those keywords in it. And oftentimes what I'm linked to is some SEO BS from, mm -hmm. you know, like a crypto publication. Yeah. But real, but what ChatGBT gives me is even if not everything in there is a hundred percent factually correct, it gives me a model and mm -hmm. framework and a simple plain English explanation, which I find far more helpful. Okay. Than and are you pay, are you a paying customer? I am. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So you're actually the first person I've talked to that is two. <laughs> One, a, a paying customer and, and two is, because look, I have the free version and I have a whole bunch of, you know, things I've asked it. Yeah. But I haven't used any of them. Right. I said, write a blog post about crypto. Okay. Wrote a blog post. I didn't actually publish that blog post. I asked it about, you know, what makes a great entrepreneur? Okay. So it gave me some points that I said, yeah, I've seen that on Twitter, you know, a lot, but, but, I, but I haven't used it. And I've, and I've been asking people, you know, I, I asked my investment committee, my investment team on Monday I said, how many people have used it? Everybody had, had tried it. Actually, you know, two people hadn't tried it. I said, okay, has anybody used it? Anybody sent me anything? Like, well, no. So I, I am, I mean, at least there are, and I said, I know there are people one that are paying because they they do have some revenue. Now they're still hemorrhaging cash, like like losing so much money. It's it's obscene. But 
I don't know. I I do agree that the the plain English response to a search far superior to Google. I, I can't stand searching in Google. I mean, except the one thing Google actually does really well, <laughs> which maybe is a, a commentary on on who's actually using it. Uh, when I ask it questions about Pokemon or Magic the Gathering, I actually get good, quick answers. I, I think that. a lot of people are <laughs> playing that? games, right? And they're asking the yeah. same questions. Like, you know, what what is, you know, so so that's interesting. But um, what, I, what I would gently push back on, and I mean this in the, the kindest possible way here, but, you know, you, you should, I think it's the youngs that are going to figure out how to use this tool effectively. And what I mean by that is like, I don't expect ChatGBT to like spit out a coherent answer that I can just like answer me this question. Here you go. It's good for a blog post. What I found it useful for so far, and this is just me reading threads and I've kind of modulated how I use it is. So for instance, I'm looking, I'm trying to create content around, um, LSTs in crypto, uh, liquid staking tokens. Yep. And I'm, and I look for metaphors, you know, one of the big problems in frankly, uh, corporate governance in TradFi and also crypto is something called the principal agent problem, right? Oh, yeah. Which is there are, you know, principals, stakeholders, owners of the company, shareholders, and then there are the managers that you know, act on their behalf and their interests aren't always aligned. So you can ask chat GBTs, like, give me a metaphor for describing the principal agent problem in crypto that I would, you know, if me as a writer or a content creator, I'd be sitting there thinking, what's a good metaphor for this? And I'd like Google stuff and it spits out random. You put stuff like that into ChatGPT, it spits out useful stuff instantly. And it saves me a long time in coming up with these like metaphors and analogies to Excellent. eloquently communicate a point. Excellent and use case. Excellent example. And that's and, the and kind I, of thing. And I would say I, I, I did get this a similar experience um, and so, so my, you're, so you're right. My knowledge base increased on a number of topics, but, but I actually didn't use the text, but that's okay. As long as I got the idea, because one of the things that I'm, I'm struggling with, um, and I'm sure it's, <laughs> I'm sure it's in the, the disclaimer that no one read. And I think we talked about this last week, but like when someone says, write a hit song for Taylor Swift. And it spits out a song and someone takes that, copy paste, sends it to Nashville. Somebody gets it in front of Taylor and says, oh, I, I like that. Yeah. Who owns that song? I think I would own it because I'm the one that used the tool. But I think in the, in the fine print, you know, open AI would say, no, no, we own that. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer. And somebody probably does know the answer, but... What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. You know, one of the cool things I found about these new technologies like crypto or AI is it sort of forces you to put new rules around schema that you've just accepted. So what AI is doing there, right, is it's running a, you know, recursive sort of model on all these different types of things, right? And it's producing this thing. That's what the human brain is doing, right? When Taylor Swift comes up with a song, she is in, in the background of her mind. I don't know if she writes her own stuff at this point, but you know, in the background of her mind, she's combining data points and inspiration that she's had and she's putting together something. It's the same thing that AI is doing, but because they're mechanically different beings now, we have to be like, well, how should that actually work? And I'm sure music, copyright, and IP has ha- been hammered. The human this brain out for years. is, I mean, one, it's amazing, right? And but but there's stuff that just makes makes no sense. Like I like it's catchy. This song, um, all the cool kids with their something kicks 
pumped up kicks, pumped up kicks, right? And then my 12 year old says, dad, that's about a school shooting. It is about like, a school oh, shooting. What? Yeah. Who we would can- write a song about a school shooting? I think it's supposed to be sort of a sad, melancholy song. There's actually, there's a bunch oh of songs God. like this. We can do a whole whole list of songs that are very, told in a very cheery uh, sort of tune, but are actually about, um, you know, what, there's a Third Eye Blind song about this uh Semi charm life, semi charm oh, kind of life. Oh yeah, yeah. You know what the that's about? Picture. I mean, it's about meth addicts. And <laughs> I'm sitting meth- there singing along. I'm like, did I just say I want to take another hit? No, yeah, <laughs> I know. I I just learned that like uh, last couple months. So no, no, okay, but nuts. but but the point there is your to your to your, to your real point that the rules have to be set, and we know what intellectual property rights are. We're actually pretty good at that. But this creates a whole new thing because if we actually get the intelligence part, like for for 53 years, 52 and a half, AI was not very I. It was truly artificial, but it wasn't very intelligent. Um, It was more rote and brute force and and, and whatever. And it was good at, you know, repetitive tasks and doing them faster. but, But now there is a shred, right? Maybe. Because to your point, if, if all it's doing is going back and finding what someone else thought a metaphor for, you know, principal agent problem is, that's not intelligent. That's just good research. That's just just as fast. It's like solving a, you know, a, a heavy mathematical calculation that would take you a long time using a pencil and paper. Using electrons is faster. So that's really not intelligence in, in any way because it's someone oh, really? else's would- intelligence, right? You know, all right. So I got, I was one of my majors in school was psych and they, I I remember this, I very vividly remember this, um, you know, they try to categorize different types of learning and there's basically, I forget the exact names of the different categories, but it's something like, you know, at a very basic level, even like cellular kind of learning, right. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, just, you know, very basic stimulus response. Then there's kind of like one level up stimulus response, which is like you poke a monkey, he kind of punks you back. Folks back. Then there's a uh, observational learning, and this is the kind of learning that they say most animals do, which is basically trial and error type learning, Pavlov's dog kind of learning, you know, uh, op- operant conditioning or, or whatever it is. Then there's a unique category called insight learning, and only humans can do it, and it's from our brains. We just come up with stuff. And I remember at the time thinking, unbelievable, that doesn't make any sense. I honestly think. We are just really good observational learners. We're just really good trial and error learners. I humans, you know, there's a there's a very strong bias for humans to put ourselves in this unique category where we're not like other animals and we're doing something we're doing something nuts up here. That's that's you know, right. It's like our opposable just, thumb, baby. I I just don't think so. I I mean, it's up for debate, and this is just my opinion. But I no, think no, no, we I do don't... the same type of learning that AI does, which is just simple trial and error learning and it we we as humans aren't very aware of what goes on in our brains there's if if you ever want to nerd out about something a very cool corner of psychology look up split brain uh trials and experiments it's a fascinating it's it's a really interesting uh rabbit hole to go down but i totally agree with you and look psych is maybe the most important thing to talk about when it comes to investing and and come to 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 you know what we're what we're doing on the show most of the time, which is talking about you know trends and themes and and ideas, it, it really is all about about human psychology. And but the thing about insight, I I I I I, I agree with you mostly because what is an insight, right? Yeah, it's that's- it's pulling something that you observe like. I can't just come up with a metaphor for principal agent unless I've observed something that I would, my, my brain function is saying, yeah, that's similar. Now, what, what the insight learning is saying is, no, you, you come up with something new. And new things do happen, but are they truly new? Or are they just an amalgamation of other stuff? And I don't know the, the trial and error part of life. I always, I always marvel at. It's like you know, who thought taking these green beans off 
a bush and roasting them and grinding them and putting them in a cup. I mean, pouring hot water over them, put them in a cup and then drinking them would be a good idea. Like, what about the Calvin and Hobbes thing where it's like, who looked at a cow, looked at the udders and said, I'm going to squeeze I'm gonna pull those there. and I'm going to drink <laughs> that stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, there's so many examples of, it is. you yeah. know, or, or who thought that let's harvest the mucus off frogs and make drugs out of it. Really? I mean- Cool, but who thought of that? I don't know. I don't know either. Let's 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 circle back a little bit here, and I, I want to sort of get your opinion on just you know sort of markets going forward from here. So we can either talk about uh, Bitcoin or where we are in the rate hiking cycle. But yeah. I mean, you know, what how do, how do we translate you know what we were sort of talking about at the beginning of this podcast? So we've got ec- forward looking economic indicators falling off a cliff, and they've actually yeah. been off a cliff for a period of time now, but they're just. <laughs> They're, you know, they're like a car that's lying. They're like smoldering. Thelma and Louise in right. mid-flight, right? Yeah, or like actually at the bottom of the ravine in a smoking mess of, of crap. And then, but then we've got this little mini bubble in AI that's serving to at least bolster the, the S&P 500 index. And then we've got crypto sort of chopping sideways for, for a while. And I, I would just be curious how you knit all of that together. Like if you had to try to dust off a crystal ball where, you know, how do, how do you make sense of the the whole story of what we're seeing? Yeah, well, so there's a couple of pieces. So one is um, liquidity drives markets, right? Ultimately, it all right. comes down to liquidity. And despite the rhetoric, right, of tightening, global tightening, not just the US, but but everywhere, despite that rhetoric, global liquidity has actually been ticking up since last October. And... Most of that's China, but but it's not just all, it's not all China. There's a whole bunch of other central banks that have reversed and have hit skip or pause. Um, some have started to talk about loosening, but 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 so the the money printer go burr is on low burr. It's not a maximum burr, but it's on low burr, and that finds its way into into risk assets, and that's why you know since October. Bitcoin's actually up 100%. I mean, that's a lot. That, that's a lot, a lot. So that's way more than stocks, clearly more than bonds because bonds got trashed. And curiously, to me at least, and, and I don't know if it's exactly right, I'll, I'll double check, but I, I think the year over year number now, no, not quite. We're, we're about a week away from the year over year number for Bitcoin being positive, right? We were at, you know, we're down about 10%. We were at 31 and now we're 27. But, you know, pretty soon we had that big drop from 31 all the way down to to 15 uh, a year ago, June. And so we're going to have a a, a one-year trailing number that's going to look really, really good. Um, And so, and that was a reflection, I think, of the fact that people were super afraid uh, because of, you know, look, we had, <laughs> I went through this whole thing, right? My birthday last year in May, you had the freaking Luna debacle, and then you had the three arrows fessing up, and then you had, you know, FTX trying to fix it, and then you had everybody going bankrupt. Uh, Father's Day weekend last year, that was the last cathartic drop. Um, and, well, not the last, that was the second last. Then you had the, then you had a rally, and then you had this, this big cathartic drop with, with FTX. But since that, right, we've actually seen really good positive trend. And I will argue, you know, sometime probably Father's Day weekend again, that will be the equinox for summer to officially start. And summer, again, doesn't mean parabolic. Summer is slowly rising, range bound, kind of, you know, back to the roller coaster, leading up to the halving next April, where then we get the next parabolic. So I'm I'm actually very constructive and, and quite bullish on, on Bitcoin back there. So uh, equally constructive and bullish on ETH. I know that'll make you happy. Um, <laughs> Because, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. I mean, in, in a good way. And yeah. I, 
you know, people call me a shit corner for that. And I'm like, I, I don't care. Um, you know, it, it is an ecosystem that is thriving and, uh, you know, there, there'll probably be others. Now, the one thing I, just one last thing on this is the thing that I actually am pretty excited about. It's hard to believe it was two weeks ago that Bitcoin Miami happened. And just that was a fast two weeks. But there was a lot of talk for the first time in my experience on real progress on L2s, L3s, and, and one chain to rule all chains, right? Which is not something I necessarily buy into, but I could see it, right? So I'm, I'm a huge proof of work fan. I believe that it is the most secure chain. I think ordinals are a great example of the best, highest quality assets are flocking to the highest security chain. And so I can see a world where we, we go from a tech stack of the internet, multiple protocols, to a single chain and lots of, of interoperability of, of legitimate L2s and L3s. That isn't necessarily going to happen, but that I could see it for the first time, a vision that that might work. On, on the macro piece, I don't believe that Bitcoin is just another macro asset that you know, is a risk asset, you know, it is uncorrelated to bonds still, still 0.0, .0 over the whole period. Yeah, it has periods of time where it gets correlated. Still 0.15, not, not 0.185, not 0.85, not 0 0.75, 0 0.15 correlated to stocks. It doesn't mean it doesn't have periods where, where it goes up during those liquidation sides. I think all the leverage has been taken out of the system. And slowly but surely, I think that's going to get built back. I mean, Santiago, right, who, by the way, if, if he's listening to this, which he probably isn't, call me back, dude. I mean, come on. <laughs> um, you know, he, he put out a Twitter poll about what, 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 what should, you know, big idea should he work on. And someone, some ones are going to build crypto banks, right? They're going to happen, despite Jamie Dimon, you know, our new presidential candidate, which is such crazy. It's not crazy. I don't think he's he actually running. I don't know no, what no, that no. was. No, no, no. That's that's a that's a whole Bilderberg thing. He and he and Ackman are besties. So that's just a weird. I don't know dynamic what Ackman's of, going on with his Twitter. It's just it's, yeah. just it's just weird. It's funny. Somebody posted a Chat GPT where they said, you know, uh, write a write an endorsement for Jamie Dimon for president and mention the president's cognitive and and copy pasted in. Uh, Ackman's thing as if it came from ChatGPT. I'm like, yeah, it kind of sounds like it did. Kind of does. Um, that's funny. Uh, yeah. We've had but, a lot of job applicants, by the way, turn in tests for things. I don't want to blow up anyone's spot, but it's clearly ChatGPT tests. So of course. if you're if you're applying for a job and there's a take home, maybe don't. Maybe use ChatGPT as a muse, but don't. Do, uh, use it as a muse, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Use it sure. as a muse, but don't 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 turn in someone else's homework. Um, but the other part is the cliff dive of economic indicators is real. Um, jobs number coming out. Um, my guess is jobs will continue to soften. And look, there's a there's an element of QE. I said this happening with, with the banks, but there's also an element of QE that's happening uh, in credit cards. Credit card debt just passed a trillion dollars. A trillion, okay? That is a stimulus, right? If, if I can borrow on my credit card and go get on an airplane, which the airplanes are full, and I can go to a restaurant, the restaurants are full, um, that looks like economic activity, but at some point, you got to pay that debt back. Credit cards are brutal, right? Interest rates yeah. are brutal. They're 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 a trap for you know people who don't have have the savings. So that that's tough. The other one is um, student loan payment suspension gone. So now people got to pay their student loans again. That that's going to take some capital out. Um, interest payments are going up. All the refinancings of commercial real estate loans and things like that. So all of that says to me sell in May and go away is going to be good advice that, you know, we're, we're going to be lower 
uh, October, November this year. Now, do we get uh, a Santa Claus rally because they claim, oh, now the Fed's going to going to cut after their skip? Sure, possible. Um, but I I would I would not be long risk assets. I would not be long equity assets at these prices here. Um, sell and may and go away exists for a reason. And I think that's going to be good advice. Mark, let me let me show you a chart. And I would love to see what this reminds you of, if if anything. This Rorschach is, test. Love it. This this is the Bitcoin price chart over, let's say, you know, the last last couple of years here. Yep. Uh basically 2021 till now. What is this? Does this remind you of anything, this particular chart? Does it remind well, it kind of looks like a camel, um, two humps. Um <laughs> yeah, the, the camel to with two humps sort of makes it a little bit difficult. Let me let me let me show you another chart, which is this is what it reminds me of, which is this bad boy. This is the classic chart that you've probably seen a hundred times. The Wall Street cheat sheet psychology of a market cycle. Now you've got this run up here, you've got capitulation, you've got a slight mean reversion before you get to the real depression and then disbelief. I CMS tweeted this out. This is exactly what I think about it as well. I think we're at exactly this point right here, which is we've just had the runoff. We got a little bit of wind back in our sails. And then I think the good news and the bad news, if you're operating in crypto at least, is you're almost, we're almost done. <laughs> you're almost done. But the night is darkest before the dawn. And Ooh. It, it would make sense. Markets do the thing, right, that frustrate people the most and lose people a lot of money. It would not surprise me if we had one more big leg down or grind down that really, you know, I in 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 the BlockWorks uh, offsite that we did in, I think, January of this year, Jason and I get out and basically, you know, sort of gave a presentation of like how we're feeling yeah. and thinking about things. And one was like in in a market cycle, especially for crypto, you have different enemies that you're facing each time, right? I forget what all the ones that we we talked about were, but during you know a bull market, it's euphoria, right? It's FOMO that you're fighting. That's the that's yep. the thing that you have to be wary of. Right now, we are entering the apathy phase, like deep into the boredom, depression, apathy phase. Nothing like is going at the rate that you hope or think that it might go. It's very disheartening. But the reason I say this is because that's that's the phase right before it all turns around. Well, well. see, here's the interesting thing. The, the chart that actually looks exactly like your chart that you just showed yeah. is the arc chart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's right. exact, right? right? I mean, like huge parabolic move, the you know, return to normal, pause, and then collapse, then the then the rally uh at the beginning of the year, and now it's going back down again. And I I I totally agree that equities are there, right? They got another leg down coming. It's probably going to be severe. I, I I actually think it's different in in digital for for two reasons. One, uh, I think the sentiment in uh, crypto is horrible, right? There's no retail interest, no retail buying. I mean. None, zero. Yeah, it's toast. Uh, no one's talking about it. No searches for it. I, I think we are at at true capitulation, and I also think that the the having cycle is more real, not more real, more uh, pervasive than the, I agree than the overall than no, than the overall general business cycle. And this is this is one of my key points of why you need to own Bitcoin. Everyone needs to own it. And I just talked to a bunch of RAs. I went, so there are different levels of, of conference, right? There's mm. great conferences like, like the Bitcoin conference and you know, institutional investor conferences, high quality conferences. Then there's like medium level conferences. Then there's some, and they're nice people, but we're talking not, not great comment. We're talking, you know, not a high end hotel. You know, these are, these are people, they're, they're, I said, they're good people. They're trying hard, but I went to one and, and it was a bunch of RIAs, you know, 
stock vloggers. I mean, they are people, they, they, they sell stocks to, to mom and pop all day long. And I was there to give the pitch on, on, on why Bitcoin. And um, there was just like, nope, nope, nope. And I, and I said it. I said, look, you, right? You all are fiduciaries. A couple of years from now, you will be deemed fiduciarily irresponsible if you don't have Bitcoin in your client portfolios. The same way you would have been deemed fiduciarily irresponsible in the 80s if you didn't follow ERISA and put equities in because it, you know, it was all bonds or then international equities or then small cap equities or then venture capital or bios. So we're, and, and, the, and the, my point there is stocks and bonds are highly correlated-ish. I mean, because they, they're, they're linked to the same things. They're linked to economic growth, interest rates, and inflation. Okay. Crypto is not really influenced by any of that. Bitcoin, millennial adoption, the technology itself, regulation, and this, this transition from the electronic age to the digital age, right? As, as the 37 trillion that's coming from my generation to your generation, and it's coming, right? Yeah. And we right. are all going to pass, you know, hopefully not soon. But but we're all going to pass. All every last boomer is going to pass, and all that money isn't going to stay at UBS and Merrill Lynch and these nice RIAs. It's going to move to DeFi and crypto. Oh, I agree. I agree. But it is, and that and so it just takes time, though. You know? And that's why like, I say that that chart that you showed. If you overlaid the arc chart, it's a hundred percent perfect. 100% perfect. And that chart's going to look exactly like the NVIDIA chart four years from now. It's going to look exactly the same. Yeah. Okay? But I'm going to argue that the Bitcoin chart's going to, going to diverge and the correlation over the next year, negative. It will yeah. be negative. Hmm. My prediction. I, I would see... I do this little handicap in my head. I would like that to be true. And because yeah. I'm aware that I would like it to be true, I I mentally take 30% off and I'm like, probably won't. You know, usually no, okay. usually so, internally so when I like want something to be yeah. true, I have this little mental flag that goes up that says, maybe that's not actually the way that it's going to work. And I will say one of the most uncomfortable charts I hated to look at during the bull market that I ignored and put out of my brain, but I – it bothered me was the correlation between Bitcoin and Tesla. Yeah. They were, you could, you could trace them line over line. Yep. Yep. And I, you know, I watched those charts. I didn't like it. I came up with alternate explanations for why that might be. And the truth is the driver of those charts were the same thing. Same what thing. Fed was same doing people. in interest rates. Yeah. yeah Robin Hood. Right. I, it's a great announcement. And the other thing you just reminded me, I thought you were going to go down this path, which um, Soros says, and I, I, I shouldn't, quote Soros anymore. Quoting Soros is like quoting Bill Cosby now. I mean, Soros has been shown to be maybe not such a nice guy, but, but he is a brilliant investor. And one of his great lines is the idea that you can predict a single outcome just goes against my way of thinking. We think in scenarios. So you got to think, yes, there is this central scenario in a bell curve, but you got to think about the tails. And you got to do that probability weighting. And I, I like you, I, I agree. I handicap the thing that I want to be true because that's just my bias. Um, and I try to stay data focused. And I, I think, I think I'm being honest when I say what I just described is based on data, right? When I see the data wash out in volumes, no interest in, in retail, institutions actually taking our calls as we get ready to raise fund four. There, there seems to be the, this new cycle, um, whereas there just doesn't seem to be any support other than the FOMO of the seven, you know, Fang Man, you know, tech names. Other than those seven names, nobody really wants to talk about owning stocks. Yeah. They're afraid because because Thelma and Louise have have driven off the cliff. Yeah, but I would agree with you. like Wiley Coyote, as long as you don't look down, you're not going to fall. So just don't look down. 
True. People aren't interested in following, so maybe we won't. Mark, this has <laughs> been uh, <laughs> best best hour of my week as per usual, my friend. I will see you here same time next week. Thank you, sir. Talk to you soon. Cheers.